and we're back. <laughs> we think <laughs> we we're, think we're, we're recording back. this like we, we did last week. We are thinking we were it. back. That's right. It. I know y'all have missed us because we've been gone for one so person, long. One person spoke to Joel about it. We didn't yeah. ask Joel if he brought it up first. No. <laughs> he might. No, he did. He's, He's shaking, shaking his, his head. head. He, he did not no. bring so it up first. We, we do have people that care that we, we missed last week. Person? One we person. Have a we person that cares. One person cared. We don't know that they cared. They just were curious why it <laughs> hadn't right. happened. Maybe they were saying, Maybe yay. Excited. Yay. It's been about time, and I now was, it's over. I was hoping when I... Ten was, months yeah. of insanity has come to an end. Mm -hmm. Has yes. it been ten months? But, we're back hoping that this ver this time, because we did record last week, it just, the file just We fixed something, died. and that fix was inferior. Uh-huh. <laughs> so maybe this one will be okay. How, yeah. how, how, you said something about 10 months. How far are we into this? Did we start it in January? We started yeah, we in started January. January oh. First week of January. First week of January was our first month, There we go. All so right. so come, we should do something for If we make it all the way to January, like if we don't yeah. get killed in the apocalypse, it's starting tomorrow on the yeah. day after election. Yes. Who knows? For those <laughs> not paying attention. Depending, I've been told by people on who wins. Apparently, Maybe. the apocalypse yes. is sitting and waiting. It will. Uh, so you you're the so election So if, if you're wondering, to, we're recording this on election day. We are. It so, is election and day. Look, Nathan, he's done his duty i've done mine i did i got my so sticker. here's what i want to say I got if my sticker oh i'm gonna let everyone there you go there's your sticker you see it joel's gonna show I'll i don't it. i don't I'll my, 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 my bottle sticker. now is a georgia you vote. know putting that on your bottle is how people get voter fraud i put mine is when it? they gave I it did. to me my sparkling ice cherry limeade which is so far my <laughs> see, favorite of that's me. how it happens just that's anybody right. can vote anyone. including mm -hmm. a bottle i got it registered that's early right. we took it reg early yep. early voting I, I gave mine to a little girl who was standing with her mom. I didn't want to wear mine. And, oh, there you, go. you know, later somebody goes, see, that little girl voted. Uh -huh. <laughs> they let it happen. They let it happen. It's they out of control. They don't care. It's what they've been telling us. That's right. So I, you early voted, didn't you, Ed? I did so early did I. vote. So did I. And stood in line for two hours. I did not have to stand that really? long. Really? I did. I was about and then my wife goes today, and it took her 14 minutes. Yeah, I, it was I only felt five really minutes stupid. for me today. I should have waited till today. I I did hear at my voting place the line was no shorter, but they had way more poll workers. Yeah, mm. there are way more poll workers at my voting. Like when I went to early vote, I think total there were people who were working it. One, two, pe one guy outside, one lady that went between inside and outside, four people sitting at the table to make sure we were who we said, including that little girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, Am I, but no one checked then, on my bottle. And then one, one body, one body, one somebody, one somebody, a, a person. It was a human being inside showing me where to go and where to put the thing afterwards. I okay. think total. So today, what is that? That's seven, six, seven. I, I voted at the Noonan Center, and I think in total there there could have been anywhere between twenty to thirty poll workers wow. total working. I know for sure there was eight. That's people. what I heard from a guy in my neighborhood. That yeah. There were thirty or so where he Man. went to vote. I know for okay. sure in the room there was over there was over. Over 10, and there were a lot just kind of like out among making sure people got And I just in. want it on record. I don't know what it is about me, but I volunteered starting in July that I would love to be a poll worker. Mm -hmm. they never I filled out the form. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I did it three different times. Wow. I filled out the form. Not only did they not respond to me, I got a no. Wow. No, I did not. I got it. Yeah. So, I was like, they, they found out who you were. So let's just say this. For anybody questioning the integrity of American elections, <laughs> I'm telling the you. fact that they wouldn't let Ed be a poll worker should give you the utmost confidence. I feel better. I feel much I, I better about my, I, my ballot. I tried my best to be a poll worker. Yeah. Okay. Well, and no. I don't mean poll worker. Yeah. <laughs> well, that would have been a bigger no. I was about to say. That, you, that probably, you probably could have made that. I'm just saying. They got uh, less strict standards. I don't know, man. Just saying. <laughs> we used to have a guy, he's passed away now, that uh, came to our church, and he had been a former strip club owner. And every time anybody nice. would go talk about going to the polls, he'd go, I used to own those. Oh, <laughs> it was a regular joke. I'd go, David, that's not where they're, you know, I know. <laughs> Only at Community Christian. <laughs> That's another Community one of those stories that we did. Only at Community Christian. This one will also get destroyed in the podcast fire. <laughs> yes. The yes. great podcast fire. All right. Now, before we go any further, uh, I have to uh, acknowledge the elephant in the room for those watching. <laughs> That's a political Wait a minute, joke. We also have a donkey and in a the donkey. Room. Okay. <laughs> we, we, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Literally. And an independent animal. Okay. Badger. <laughs> I've heard it's. I've heard it's badger. 
Is it? No, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the obvious thing that they're seeing, those watching on YouTube, is that we are spaced apart a little more today. So. Well, they can't see that because we don't have one shot That's of us right, together. But they're they wondering can, they why can, it keeps flipping back and forth. It's yeah. because we got tired of sitting close to Jason. Jason was making us sit close. You guys know I don't like being that close. That's the lie. <laughs> I'm, anything, I'm the one Jason, in the office. I'm the one that likes distance. Yeah, as I say, if anything, Jason pushed us away. <laughs> yeah, so you missed That's up. correct. I like sitting close, and Jason pushed me away. Whichever cut of this, Joel, you'd like to take. Or whatever. <laughs> so I like it because I, uh, I just dropped my bottle cap. And while he's on another take, I can just get up and go walk and go get it. The trouble so. is these cameras don't have lights, so we don't really know when he's on another mm, take. Because Joel could not be listening, and he never switches. <laughs> <laughs> he just did right there. <laughs> I got it. All right. I don't know if he. I don't know if he took the shot or so, not. But so, but for safety purposes and uh, and, uh, and other considerations, other considerations, we are we are. Sp- we didn't, wanna, we didn't want to wear masks. We, we have decided as a staff to yes. start wearing masks when we're around each other for each other's safety. Not something we're doing for other pe- everybody, but we, and so we did not want to have to do that for the yes. muffled sound of the podcast. What yes. you mean is we're not asking everybody else to outside the I staff. meant we don't care about <laughs> it. <laughs> the way you said it was we That's care it about our like. safety, not anyone else's safety. What you mean is we are not Thank requiring people. Thank you for clarifying people. you're wrong. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You are not required to wear one to come to church, but (laughs) we are wearing them. Okay. Question. What's the most important part of your morning routine? Wow. The most important part of my morning routine is uh, (laughs) getting up on time, because if I don't, I will allow important things to slide off the plate because I think I'm late. Ah. Mm, so good. so you you're just laying in bed to sleep? Is that why you don't get up? For there may you know there could be all, I I don't normally set an alarm. I oh, okay. I have I have one day a week I set an alarm. Mm. Otherwise, I tend to just wake up at the same time Got every it. day. Okay. But on one day a week, I want to make sure I I get up on time, so I set an alarm. Mm-hmm. So occasionally I will be 10 minutes late waking up or 20 minutes late. And if that's the case, even though it's not vital that I do, I will let important things get in the way of me doing what I should do. So after that, the most important thing is once I am up on time, I then start my morning ritual, which I have a morning ritual that, you know, includes me sitting and spending time with God Mm -hmm. in various different ways. Yes. Yeah, I I was going to say the most important part of my morning routine for other people would be my shower. Uh, <laughs> now, but but for me... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to let Nathan answer, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. But for me, uh, it is the same as... And I have, because of our discipleship rhythm mm-hmm. that we've all entered into these past few years, it has become... It, it, I can say truly now, um, it. I don't feel right. And I've never had that in my spiritual life before where... I could I could miss it and then get halfway through the day and go oh you know I, I didn't read God's word or I didn't I didn't stop but now I can't, almost can't it mm-hmm. feels odd mm-hmm. to me because I I've I've gotten and we talked about habits back in January I developed the habit of doing it in the same place same table yep. same chair me too I have a Bible sitting there that I read from and. And then I go through my check-in with my the guys that are in my group. I reach out to them in the morning, review my day, which is what we all do. But it, it, if if I'd miss that, I just I, I can feel it. it. You know, and you taught, and, and I loved what you said on Sunday, Nathan, about you know these habits that get locked into our flesh. Mm, um, mm-hmm. That one is a good one that is locked yes. into my flesh because I feel it in my body yep. when I don't do it. Yep. And, and I think that's a, I'm I'm happy about that. I've never had that in my that's life. That's a before. second question I'd like to ask. So remind me, I have two questions. Okay, we'll let right. Nathan go. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think what everybody said so far, I agree on both the getting up on time. Um, so honestly, one of the most important parts of my morning routine is actually going to bed on time the previous day. Uh, that was something that struck me maybe a couple of years ago. Um, just that. I, I have a tendency, similar to what uh, Ed was saying about if you wake up late, you feel like you have to do stuff. I have a tendency, because of my personality, that I run real hard all day, and I have a hard time stopping myself from from doing things. So it's often 8 or 9 o'clock till I'm willing to stop, 
then I realize, oh, I haven't connected with my wife all day. And then I try to cram that in and also cram in, oh, I want to cool down and watch some TV and mm. like have this. And so I would often end up staying late. Not, I don't think for most people, I, now that I've talked to people, I'm, I'm often in bed at 930. Uh, that's, that's my goal is to be in bed at 930 because I wake up very early. And so that's important. The other part that's important for me about waking up is I started putting my cell phone out of the room and setting an alarm on my cell phone outside of the room. Uh -huh. And it forces me, I have to get up to go turn off the cell phone. At mm -hmm. that point, I'm already in my bathroom and I'm like, okay, time to, down, I can do whatever mm -hmm. I need to. I'm not laying in bed. Yeah. But then the other, the other thing is they both said is uh, my discipleship routine is important. But uh, one thing that's been very key, I think maybe the last three or four months we've been doing this. I, I read from a book of prayer. Uh, that's part of mine. And I've weaved my discipleship reading and all of my communication into that book of prayer. Uh, but about three or four months ago, maybe, maybe I don't know, Joel's in on this, so producer Joel can somewhere, two or three, you're saying? Uh, we, I do a prayer meeting now with people virtually. I have a prayer meeting every morning, and we, we, we read through this book of prayer, and we share prayer requests, and we do. We, there's a whole ritual behind it. It's become one of the most important parts of my day. Mm. Um, it's very nice to get to share that with other people. So, so when cool. you all read in it's some form the Book of Common Prayer, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's not the... It's a modern translation. Yeah, it's not the uh, Anglican Book of Prayer. So there's some other... Tra there's other denominational traditions. It's sure. A, well, ecumenical is wow. it's referred to. Yeah, there are all kinds of... Sure. Anglicans, mm -hmm. one, there are all kinds of... Yeah, it yeah. pulls from that... All different kinds of denominations. Okay. Yeah. I started, you know, I started using common prayer books. Mm, I remember talking, it was the first year we started the Madras campus, so that's been a long time ago. That's in 2008. I remember talking at the Madras cafeteria. We had a frontline meeting at Madras, if y'all remember that. I remember day, that. And mm -hmm. I talked about using common prayer books. I love common prayer books. I don't do them 52 weeks a year anymore. I still do them. My mind doesn't run well if I lock into routines that sure. become routine for me, mm -hmm. I have to break all routines yeah. for me. Uh, anyway, I wanted I, to ask you, you about... Got, you got two questions. I do. Say. I have one for him about his thing. Uh, when you all do the Book of Common Prayer, do you do you read? Are you the reader, or does everybody read? Uh, well, when we first started it, there was a... Um, the website now is all messed up, but there was a website um, called commonprayer.net, I think, Um and uh, anyway, yeah, and they could read along with me out loud if they wanted. I chose not to because it's a it's a video chat. It would be impossible to sync up us reading the things right. together, and so it right. would sound weird. But yeah, I read this one. Unlike other, this one thing I really like about this book of uh, common prayer is that there's music in it. Mm. So there's they have suggested songs once again from all different kinds of traditions. But sometimes I use theirs. Sometimes I use songs we sing here, or just songs that. I really that I, that speak to whatever we're talking about. So, but yes, I'm I'm primarily the one reading. But then there's always a place where we share prayer requests with one another, and obviously not everyone has one every day. But uh, it's just good, and that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So my question for you, uh, Jason, yes. and this may go for Nathan too. I'm interested in your. You said shower <laughs> was an important part for other people. Are is that the beginning of your daily ritual? No. Like you get up and you shower and no. then go do other things? No, I, I do I do the the discipleship rhythm first. Okay. Nathan, do you do you include um uh, body kind of taking care of your body? Mine mine is uh Yes, yes is the answer to that question. I I don't I don't uh, shower before I leave the house, so that probably yeah. Some right. people some I go people, to the I go, go to, to the gym, gym and shower and I gym. shower at the gym. So I okay. so I get up almost every day at five thirty, and I I have some exercise time before. But we're all podcast listeners, and so I I have podcasts going, and usually I'm listening to some kind of sermon. There's a break in that where I have. It's important for me because of my personality that I have personal devotion time outside of communal devotion time because yes. I've realized for me even though the communal prayer time is is bit so beneficial in a different way than I thought it would be um it, there's easy because I'm the reader for it to become performative and so I so I have a period where it's just for me um I send my email for my discipleship 
then I do the common prayer, then I go to the gym. So mine's a little all weaved together. Um, my shower is typically my first part of my morning. Mm, okay. I should say brushing my teeth. Uh, but <laughs> brushing my teeth is my very first mm part of my morning rich, rich I didn't life. say that I also brush my teeth because I am going to see people and that's yes, it's offensive that's, that's uh, right so yeah. now that, that we wear masks though it's I'm the only that's one true. that's bothered that's I'm true. the only one that's bothered but I, that's just yeah. an old as I mean I don't know it's it is similar to what Jason said about discipleship now that I've done this so long even though as you said my routine like I haven't done book of common prayer forever so there's always some prayer part journaling part Bible part, practice part, but it all shifts. But as Jason said, it is like brushing my teeth for me. Mm -hmm. Even though I could brush my teeth at, at the gym and when I'm doing all that, there's something about ever since I was a little kid, first thing I do, I go to the restroom and then I go brush my teeth. That's the very first thing I do. And so it's weird for me, even mm -hmm. though it's not necessary That's anymore. Right. That's right. And like, it's yeah. similar. If I have a day where I don't have any time with just me and God or me and other believers, I feel it. I yeah, can my, physically mine is feel deeply it. ingrained. And I, I can remember doing, I don't think there's been a time in my life that hasn't been my, I don't, I mean, when I was a little kid, I got up super early because my first chore was milking cattle, mm. uh, you know, and so that's five or six. And I can remember I brushed my teeth before going to the barn. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know why, but I, I, somebody obviously told me that's the way that yeah. goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so, anyway, yeah. I just interested in that. Okay. What was that? Second? You got both questions out? Dang Dang it. Both? I can't. Did I? Tell I knew you were going to forget one. I, I, knew <laughs> I got that. That was the first one. Now I can't remember what the second one was. Okay. But whatever. It All came right. around the time when Jason was talking about it being weird when you miss it. Yeah. That's what I remember. I was trying to figure mm -hmm. out. Oh. What your question oh. Was. Uh, yeah. My question is, do you have a routine? like a vacation, which often for me throws my daily routines into whack because I tend not to get up at the same time. Mm -hmm. There tends to be other people because I tend to get up relatively around the same time as my wife on vacation. Mm -hmm. There's often conversation that's my routine is pretty silent when I first get up. Yeah, now. me too. Yeah. Uh, so, um, when I'm on vacation, no, it, it, I'm, I'm thinking back to the few, you know, the ones that I've had recently, it, it didn't change. Cause I, I'm still getting, even when I want to sleep in these days, I still wake up pretty much with the sun if I don't set an alarm. Ah. Um, and that, that I, I just don't sleep past that yeah. wh whether I want to or not. And, and I have teenagers, so uh, when mm -hmm. we're when we're all together, they're sleeping until you know, sure, whenever. You so got, you got time. So I got time before they wake up. Sure, and yeah. so I go and I I I'm, I kept my rhythm pretty well intact even on vacation. I I still do mine, but it's not at the same time, and my rhythm always feels slightly off. Yeah, that's, on vacation. I always I, I always keep the same rhythm. It's even even on not on every weekend day. That's been one. Been one well, I have a w weekend rhythm too. Yeah. I do, I do. But my my only true weekend in that sense is Saturday, and it's it's been a uh, negotiation with my wife and I because once I'm up, it's hard for her not to be up. True. And so I I agreed on Saturdays I would not wake up at five thirty in the morning. I would sleep until six thirty in the morning. And my wife has forty years of practice of ignoring me. Yeah. <laughs> and so my, my, yeah. my ability, she gets up earlier than me now because she, in the last mm, 60 days, because she is doing an exercise routine yeah. that she mm -hmm. goes very first thing. Okay. So, yeah. So even when we were on vacation I, just recently, I was, I was up at 530. I also and, now have a night routine like you, which mm -hmm. I haven't, I, I've struggled with sleep most of my life, but read a book on that sometime back as I try to learn and. I now have a nighttime ritual that has really, really changed that all. I, I've read that as well. That that that's a very important thing to prepare your body for sleep uh -huh. as it, much as the sleep. It signals. It signals yes. to me. Becky and I have a certain kind of TV program we watch. Mm -hmm. It signals to my brain. Mm -hmm. Okay, after this, this is it. it's going to be bedtime. Yeah. Well, and you know, there's 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 some study. And I can't I can't ever remember where I read it because I was trying to send it to someone the other day. So this may be something I completely made up, but I remember at some point reading <laughs> this that what that 
what happens the last 30 minutes of your day carries over into the next 30 the, the next day that we know for sure that whatever you do first thing when you wake up sets the tone for your day and everyone kind of gets that like you don't actually wake up angry something ha- there are some thoughts that are triggering you but if it happens in the first 5 minutes mm. Like you were talking about feeling rushed. Everyone knows that. If you wake up and you're like, oh, oh I'm late, I'm yeah. late, the rest of the rest day you of feel day. like you're behind. Yep, mm-hmm. that's a, you're half step behind the rest of the day. And so there was something I remember reading about whatever you set your mind on at the end of the day. And so I'm not as good about this as I once was, but for a period of time I would try to end by reading a psalm or something like that for the, for the purpose of slowing myself down and not, not going to bed to the sound of the TV, because I did that so, I mean, I, I'm still guilty of it. I mean, it's not, and I don't know that it's a huge deal, but I think I think the thing you talked about with sleep, one thing I've been very uh, convinced of, and I've seen the benefits in my life uh, are, if our, if our goal in life as believers is to, to, to love our neighbor as ourselves, and by loving our neighbor, we are, we are loving God, right? Right. Uh, and love is described as being patient and kind. We know for sure when you are sleep deprived, it is harder for you to be patient and kind. And so there, I think there's a key spiritual element to getting the required amount of sleep because, and everyone knows it. I mean, we just had, Jason kind of made a joke about it on Sunday of the, the time change. He was like, you know, if you're, mm-hmm. if you're older, you don't, you don't stay up later. You go to bed because you're like, I can get an extra hour of sleep. And everyone on time change Sunday, at least this one, Talks all the time. Oh, it just felt so good. Yeah. Well, you could get an extra hour of sleep a night. Like that's not impossible for no, you. No, it's not. Yeah. Yes. And so that nature of it, I think, is just huge. And there are huge health benefits to to Major. sleeping the correct amount. Major. I've, I've seen. I see it in my kids more oh, yes. more than in myself. But I. But I, I. It reminds me of how important it is to me because I. I watch, you know, we see things in other people than we more than we see in ourselves. And sure, I can, I can always tell, I, and I can tell them. I know why you're feeling the way you feel. And it has to do with your sleep, and they argue with me. But sure, I'm, yep. I'm always right. So yes, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> All right. Um, last week, which when we we lost the podcast, we had answered a question from a listener, and because we weren't able to post that. We're going to go back, and we're going to re-answer that question because I didn't want them to think that we ignored them. We are so, dedicated to our that's listeners. That's right. And so, the good thing for the listener is, uh, I don't know about you guys, I don't remember what I said last week. Exactly. So this will nope. be like we're just answering it new. Fresh thoughts. So, so we hope it's memorable yeah. to you. <laughs> now, and, that, and I, I'll set it up by saying this. It was written in response to that message from two weeks ago. So this would have been... Uh, you know, it was you. It was Jason's the one I did. That's right. You. So it was the one that I taught on uh, believing the lies and then countering the lies with the truth in Scripture and all of that kind of stuff and how uh, the lies, what causes us to be triggered by the different things that happen in our... So if you forgot, just go back and watch it. Anyway, (laughs) here was the question that they asked about that. And I thought it was such a good... It brought up a lot of good things for us to talk about. So here, I'll just read their question. It says, The suggestion from Sunday of writing down the lies that you believe and then what God says was really good. Thank you. Any suggestions for handling being triggered when you don't believe the lies? And that was their question. Uh, And then they go on to explain it. It says, hearing the lies or the insults that someone says triggers me to anger. I don't believe them, the lies, and I know they aren't true. But I'm still triggered to get angry or sad that they even said them. I'm most concerned about things said directly to me and about me, but I also get annoyed with things like spin, innuendo, and half-truths in ads as well. So there's the question. All right, I remember, I remember, for those of you who didn't get to hear it, I remember we started with the first part of that of if there are lies being said about you, um, insults, right? Isn't yes. that one word? Insults and those kind of things that... Uh, that it is okay that those things make you angry, right? Mm-hmm. Like triggering, right. like when someone is insulting you or trying to attack you, trying to go, it's okay that there's a little bit of anger. That's a natural response to, to any kind of injustice or especially if it's 
if it's like on a category of anything abusive that's being said or done towards you, yes. anger is the correct response of, I mm-hmm. don't deserve to be treated this way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think drawing boundaries is the most helpful thing you can do in a situation like that, mm-hmm. where somebody, when it is clear, you know, not in this thing we've been talking about, of it feels like an insult, but they didn't really mean anything by it. When it's clear, I've told this person, hey, that hurts me or that causes damage to me and they continue to do it and it's clear that the intention is to cause me harm drawing boundaries is about all you can do it's the only thing that's healthy for you and helpful for them so Mm -hmm. i think that's the first part i get you feel like well i don't believe it but it still hurts when they said it well of course it hurts when they say it because Mm -hmm. they're trying to be hurtful but you don't have to allow that to happen so i think that's Mm -hmm. an important caveat to begin with um but there's a lot more to this question than just that. Yes, there is, and and I and I think I part of what I my thought was when I first read the question was, um, I, and I and I do and whoever wrote this, I don't mean to attack the premise of your question, but I would push back a little bit on this idea of, oh, well, I'm triggered not because I believe lies, but because lies being told or whatever. I still think that the the uncontrolled response of anger right. and resentment is still could be traced back to possibly something that you do believe about what's being said yes. that is causing that reaction in you. And it could be something like, you know, I have to make sure everything that is said about me is correct. And I, and I feel the need to justify myself yeah. in every situation. I would, I would push back on that and say, well, no, not actually, actually you don't. That That's not an absolute, um, so there may be something going on behind. Again, I don't know because I don't know the person. Um, but does, does that make sense? Did I make it does sense? to me? And you know, when I heard it again this time, and I can't remember what we said the time before, there seems to be, and boy, this may not be true. So I don't. I wish I was having a conversation. It sounds like there's a lot of. I wish I could control this. I right. wish I could. I can. What I don't want anybody to do is to think this is true. Well, mm. I can't really control what anybody thinks. Mm-hmm. That's right. I don't know that what was said isn't confirming what they already thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mm-hmm. don't have any control over any of those kind of things. Yes. And in the end, if truth is really truth, I don't have to f- defend mm-hmm. it. Truth itself is a defense. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, when you talk about one, because I think that's true, I think that's the other beneficial part on anything of having strong boundaries, because boundaries protect you, but boundaries actually protect the other person from you. So when I get to a place where I think it's my job to control what you think about me, that's not in my boundary, mm-hmm. right? And the way that I, I, I often, when I talk to teenagers about this idea of boundaries is I use the example of boundaries are just fences and all a fence does is it does keep people out but also keeps if my neighbor has good boundaries and good fences it keeps me from going in and so if there is if there is a piece of trash in my yard it's my responsibility but if there's a tr- piece of trash in their yard it's it's not I can't go over there and tell them mm-hmm. this is what you do on your yard in your time they have a place to do it now this is where the problem comes. When they start coming to my fence and throwing trash in my yard, <laughs> I may need a higher fence and a higher boundary to say, you, I will not allow you to throw your trash into my yard. But that's the benefit of there are things that are in control and their thoughts, their emotions, the way they think about me. And that's the hard part when people talk about protecting your reputation. There are things you should do to pr- protect your reputation as far as you can. But part of your reputation is what they think about you, and I can't control what this person thinks about me, I'm, but I get the desire to. I'm probably wrong in this, but I, I battled this thing of protecting your reputation for a long, long time because when I was growing up, that was a big deal that my mom and dad said. And I, I get, I was, I was doing things that they thought were hurting their reputation. It, in fact, didn't affect their reputation at all. And it didn't, it, it did become my reputation, but it became my reputation because it was my character. Right. (laughs) Everything that people thought about me that they were afraid that people would hear, the reason people heard it is because it was all true. Right. And so then, you know, I began to think, 
Are there ways to protect your reputation? There are, but they generally involve me trying to manage what you think about me, which could lead to me not being completely truthful with what's true about my character yeah. and caring more about what you think than my character. Yeah. The only really way to protect my reputation is to work on my character, not about what you think. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to boundaries, I, I can remember uh, when the first time, you know, and, and uh, Henry Clouds and his partner, John Townsend, are the first ones that made boundaries a big deal in our current culture. Right. I'm not saying mm -hmm. they thought it up. Yeah. But that idea of fences is the way they taught it. Yeah. And the benefit when it finally got clear in my mind is it not only is setting a boundary so that four other people know, hey, you know, this is, I can't let you do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It really is, it defines my property. Yes. for me because I am a person, I mean, by my personality, I want to be in control. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm not embarrassed to say, I mean, I want to be in control mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> of everything. And so I would often run over into other people's boundaries. Mm -hmm. I was not staying in my own yard. If I thought they mm -hmm. were wrong, I wanted to set them right. Yeah. yeah. But and sometimes it's only my job to set them right in my boundary. Yes. If they're in my boundary throwing trash into my yard, that's okay. Them writing pieces of paper about me and throwing them down in their yard, that ain't on me. The only way right. I could know they were doing that is for me to walk across the fence over into their right. yard and pick it up. Or I hear people say often, so-and-so told me so-and-so talked about me. Yeah, And so what just happened was another person just came and did with me what they're going to tell me they did with somebody else. Right. <laughs> they talked about me to somebody else, so then they came to me and talked to the somebody about the somebody else to yeah. me. Yeah. What we know is in common is that person. Yeah. <laughs> and I think where this gets real blurry, and I, and I, and I see this... Uh, and I probably am reading into the question, but I think I'm close to this. Um, it gets real blurry in the world that we live in with so much social media. Yeah. And we're reading so much of other people's thoughts. Yeah. Sure. And, and, we, and when we do that, it often feels as if they're over in my space throwing it at me. When not, that's not necessarily true. They're just holding an opinion. They just happen to put it into a forum where I, I, I would normally not hear it. You know, that, that is so true about everything that everybody says now is so vastly public and, and widely spread, and it feels as if it's constantly. But the truth is, I, I did allow it in. And I decided to read it. I decided to go and seek it out and listen. And I've, told, I've said this to many people. There, there are so many people saying all this stuff that's wrong on Facebook and stuff. And I go, well, you didn't have to go read it. Well, and I'll say... Not in my feed, because well, that's once right. I, <laughs> that's right. there is a thing. I don't have to unfriend anybody. Mm -hmm. I just say I would not like to see this person's that's comments right. anymore. That's right. Well, and I, it, does, it helps me because now I don't have to think anything different about them. No. Because they can think whatever they want to the way it has always been. Mm. And don't you think, I mean... There's, there's such a human nature when you talked about wanting to control. I think all of us want to control. I think all of us go, go about it different ways and we use different terms, right? Like I think often people who see themselves as helpers by nature become very uh, crossing boundaries and not seeing it. They go into other – and they begin they, – there's a, there's a big pile of trash in yours. You never asked me to come in your yard and clean it up, but I'm just going to start doing it for you. And eventually, in what eventually becomes codependent relationships, you now just expect I'm going to come into your yard and clean up so, your, your trash for you. A great example that I think most people who are parents or who mm -hmm. have worked with parents is – Parents have a really hard time with the boundary between themselves and their child. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. my child strikes out even though I know he practiced a lot and he can, in fact, hit the ball. <laughs> and somehow I feel like that That's says something about me. Uh -huh. yeah. And so I want to say out loud at the game, he practices all mm -hmm. the time yeah. and because I'm now defensive, I think somehow I'm helping my kid, whereas with one of my kids, 
I remember they'd strike out and go back and pick up a Lego and start playing with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't feel the need right. to defend themselves at all. And the same thing continues on all the way up to people get to seniors in high school and the kid decides, you know what? I've got a good enough thing. I'm already going to go into college. I'm already going to get to do everything I want to. I don't think I'm going to go to school today. And the parent feels like, yeah, <gasps> yeah. yeah. You're, you're saying bad things about mm -hmm. the kind of parent I am. No, no I'm saying no. a lot about the kind of person I am. That's right. Well, and it doesn't say anything about the kind of person. it says more about you by you being triggered. Yes, yes. it does say yeah. something about you that you thought your kid somehow reflected on you. And there are people that do think your kid reflects on you, and that says more about them, them. than it does about <laughs> your kid or you. Right. they're wrong. <laughs> and don't yeah. you, and that's okay. Don't you think too that this goes into and I can't remember this we've now had a few podcasts where we've talked and no one saw it. So I don't know if this is something I, we've talked about before. I know it is. I don't know if anyone else has seen us talk about this, but that I know is is so in counter to the way Jesus handled approaches to truth and approaches even to correcting other people's sin. We really do and I don't think this is a I know it often gets pushed off on Christians because Christians we do this a lot, and we get this wrong. I think everyone in our culture sees it as my job. I see someone say something untrue. I see someone behaving badly. It is my job to go fix them, mm. and not just to say, "Hey, I don't think that's right or healthy," but to go, "How could you? Yeah. This is this. What you know? Blah blah blah. Let me tell you all." Or the to unfriend them, or to, to unfriend be, them, or to start putting to, ultimatums on them, or or to start with a feeling of disgust because yes. of your viewpoint, and that. That's never our posture. But, you know, Jesus had so much in his interactions, and I remember talking about this. One thing that struck me this year of reading through the Gospels again is how much Jesus weeps. Um, and it's this very, I think, very parental kind of weeping of watching a child destroy themselves. And when he looks at the nation of Israel, which, mm -hmm. you know, is, is, is God's children, and he looks at people who are— you know, one of the verses sticks out to me a lot is when just and it's repeated several times in different of the gospels where it said Jesus looked at the crowds and he had compassion, sure. like this deep feeling within mm -hmm. his gut, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And what I always what had never occurred to me until recently is, well, you're the shepherd, go in and shepherd them. Mm -hmm. But what he knows is I can't be their shepherd unless they're willing to be my sheep. That's right. And so what we often do, and I've talked about parents, but I think this is just translated to the way we talk about politics, the way we talk about everything in our culture, is it's my job to force them to want my advice. So I'm going to keep debating you and arguing you. And I think there's this high level of what we call debate on social media that's not, but there's this feeling of when you say something untrue, it's my job to go to every untruthful person, and really what I mean is someone who doesn't like my candidate, and go after you and tell you how wrong you are we don't see that in the Gospels. In fact, most often, Jesus isn't walking around to people going, mm -mm. even with the mm -hmm. Pharisees. He's not yeah. walking up. They're often coming and attacking him or asking him a question, and most of the time, he just responds with other questions. Exactly. He doesn't go back and go, hey, here's the full truth claim, because what he's trying to figure out is, do you want to be my sheep? I'm going to ask you a question, and by the way, you respond to what I say. I know where you are in this. I try to adopt that a lot in my parenting because... It, even though my kids are young, there is this level of, am I going to come in, because my wife and I say this a lot, how long are we going to keep fixing this problem for them? Mm -hmm. when, they're, when they're 12, am I going to be fixing this problem for them? What about when they're 17? Like, there is a level as a parent that when they're young, I have to help walk them through the process. But you know what's easier as a parent, and I think it's easier as a friend as well, is just to fix it. Mm -hmm. Like, my, my, my daughter loses her temper over losing a game and it's either easier to just come here and hold her and oh it's not that big or to go uh, -uh that is not how we act you don't do that go to your room those two solutions are easier than sitting down and taking the time to go okay why do you think you're feeling this way mm -hmm. why do you think you're upset well it's because she beat me and what does that make you think about her that she's better than me okay let's talk about that and walking you through the process because now we're engaging it. But I think with friendships, we do the same thing. Oh, yeah. I come in, you're behaving in a way that I don't like or is irritating me. It's just quicker to go, shut up. Or, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's not, 
the Jesus approach. And I know that's a little farther from the, the initial question, but I do yeah. think there's this feeling of I have to defend myself or, as y'all were saying, the truth in general, that mm-hmm. there's, there's somehow our country's going to get away from the truth as if we were ever just smack dab on the truth yeah, to like begin with. like that ever happened. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I, and so back to the original question I think the person asked, I, I, would, I would encourage you um, to, to consider instead of the reaction of being frustrated, and I think you, you mentioned being annoyed or angry at someone being out of, out of sync with the truth, I would ask myself why that is, and then I would, I would be much more, I would advise you much more to, to live in the area that Nathan just mentioned where Jesus lived when he heard it of being really hurt or sad or compassionate for the person, right? I, I think that is the more Christ-like posture. Sure. And when you find yourself in that place, I think you are in better company than in the more the, the the posture of being angry or feeling the need to go and be the savior or the corrector of all of that untruth. True. That that to me seems to be the better posture. Jason, so. can you speak a little bit? This this is going to take us back into the question a little bit further. But I remember last time you told this story. It's, the story of the mint. Oh I'm trying to give us a little lead-in story yeah, of the I mint. I forgot can, we had talked about I, it. But, I don't remember. Well, this is, this y'all is aren't good. surprised. I don't yeah. remember. Okay. It, it, M-I-N-T? Yes. Yeah, the mint. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you. And is it about a coin? No, mm. it's not about the minting <laughs> process. It's an actual mint. Tell us about money. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's an actual mint. Uh, basically, where I, I learned... Uh, this was from my counselor, and uh, I was in a session one time, and one of the things that he had worked with me on is uh, dealing with criticism from people, um, and he had realized that that was something that often got me off track mentally, and, and it, it, I spun a lot of mental energy into the things that people said that were critical of me and not wanting to be in the wrong and all of that kind of stuff, and so he led me through this, this exercise where he said, now, I'm going to say some things to you, and I just need you to sit and listen for a moment. And, and I didn't know where we was going. And then all of a sudden, he just started criticizing me. And he he had known me for a little while, so he knew the things that kind of hurt and stung. Trigger you. Triggered me. <laughs> and he started saying all this stuff. And, and, and I knew he probably didn't mean it, but it still I was hearing all this negative yes. stuff towards me. And so the kind of stuff that people who were angry with me would have said. And he just went through this, and it lasted for a couple of minutes. And so I'm taking all of it and listening to it. And then as, he, and as soon as he finishes, as he gets done, he reaches over to a bowl that had mints in it, and he grabbed a mint, and he said, oh, here you go. And he just handed it to me. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what was going on, so, you know, I'm trying to play along, I guess, with this illustration. So I'm being polite. And I reach and I grab it, and uh, and he looks right at me, and he says, you know, you don't have to take the mint. Mm-hmm. And and I, at that moment, I connected it back to what he was doing. And what he was trying to teach me was, you know, just because someone says it to you, that does not mean that you absolutely have to internalize it, that mm-hmm. you have to roll it around in your head and you have to live it out or live with it or try to correct it. You can just let it just go and it it just becomes air and then you refuse it and you move on to the next thing. And it, it had left a, such an impression on me that uh, I actually took one of those mints from that bowl and I have it in a place in my mm. bathroom where I get ready every morning and I see it every day. And every time I see it, I remember the phrase, you don't have to take the mint. Don't take the mint. And so now when I do read negativity or I feel it coming my way, I often remember that. And it yeah. reminds me that that doesn't have to that doesn't have to live with you. You know, you can just you can just sort of let that go. And it's uh it's been a great reminder for me. So that's the story of the men. Yes, that's the story of the men. And don't you think that's central to how Jesus was able to stay rooted in in not having to in, engage with all these things was he had such a firm grasp on who he was, who yes. God was, the way the world operated because of who God was, and he didn't feel the need. I do think a lot of us live in this very insecure, unstable, anxious place, even if you're not an anxiety kind of person. If that's not, you don't think of yourself as being anxiety prone. I think there's a lot of an- anxiousness within us that is, Part of the reason I have to defend these things is, what if they're right? 
Mm. What if they're right? And I got to argue to convince you you're wrong so that I just feel more stable when I'm right mm -hmm. in this understanding of, so when someone calls me an idiot or comes after mm -hmm. me and does this, like you said early on, there may be a part of you that's believing that lie, sure. but Jesus was able to have people say all kinds of things about him, but because he was so rooted, he was able to not take the mint. Yeah, mm -hmm. and even when we come to things like spin, which it sounds to me we're talking about ads or something on TV, and probably in this age it's political. I don't sure. know that, but I doubt, I think, I remember last week I was saying, I doubt they're upset about L'Oreal. Right. kind of spin of how your hair is going to look. I yeah. doubt that's upset anybody. Nothing gives me bouncy curls. I've tried. <laughs> doesn't work. Liars. You can't get a curl out of this because I keep it sh short enough that doesn't happen. Go. So <laughs> anyway, I, it's got to be about spin, about things they hear, about truth, about what they think is our country. I want it to be set right because I think it really matters what people believe about our country because I really believe that my thought of how to do this country really matters and that long term this would be best, which reveals I haven't totally bought into the fact that there is a kingdom that's bigger mm. than this country, mm. <laughs> that as a follower of Christ, my security is not found in who the president is or who the politician is or what anybody even thinks about the way to govern yep. is because this particular form of democracy has not been around except for the length of our country. Yep. It has not existed before. Mm -hmm. So there were ways to follow God and are ways to follow God in the kingdom of God that have nothing to do with this republic form of democracy. So which will not last forever. Will, which it's won't gonna last die for, at It's going to go away. And I know people hate for me to say that. I, I, they cringe when I say it. It's going to go away. It may not. It may not every, maybe not in our lifetime. Every but, other form has gone it away. It always does. No one currently follows a Pharaoh. Yeah. <laughs> There, that does yeah. not exist, and it ruled the war It ruled the planet for a while. Yes, yeah, I think one of the one of the hardest things for people. I think personally, I think politically, I think socially, I think in general with Jesus's teachings are how poorly our imaginations are formed, and what I mean is our ability to to view the world differently than it is, and that's really what Jesus was doing. That's why his parables were the way. It's why that you read parables and they're confusing, and you go, okay, because the way way we're often taught to do it is, okay, I'm supposed to be one of these people. God's supposed to be one of these people. I'm supposed supposed to behave like one of these people and then you read things and we've answered some of these where you read it and jesus said well that guy who i guess god's not the guy who lied and and, and cheated and, people and cheated and, people am i supposed to be the one who lied and cheated or maybe people? nobody's any of those he's talking about a principle that got taught right or he and he's capturing this imagination yes. of the way the king i think often the reason jesus teaches in parables is because it is supposed to it is supposed to confuse you a little bit. It's supposed to go, well, that's not the way the world operates. And precisely. Yes. And but this is the way the kingdom operates and it doesn't operate. And so we can't imagine a world that isn't shaped from the top down. That mm. whoever whoever's in charge, they're the ones who's going to shape the world. So we have to get the person on top who will do what we want so they will shape the world. When then Jesus comes on the planet and goes, I'm going to start from the bottom up and I'm going to come to the poor and the powerless. I'm going to be poor and within this world, powerless. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give up all the power I have to get here, mm -hmm. and then whatever power I gain while I'm here, I'm going to give it up too. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and our yeah. imaginations are so poorly formed. We look at that, and I, and I hear Christians say that, and that's good, and kindness is the right way. I know that being— But how do we get the right person in office? Yes. Well, and there's, there's coming a time where, you, you know, it, that's not going to get you through the world. And what no, I it's not. No, and I would say, no, it wasn't. And for the early church, it didn't. They had a shorter fuse on most of them. Well, they, and, and Jesus looks and, at and Pilate, okay. and Pilate, Pilate says, you know, are you the king? He goes, I, you said it, but if I were a king, then the way you think about it, my kingdom's just not of this world. It didn't like right. any kingdom you've ever seen, so mm -hmm. I get it doesn't make any sense to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's okay. That's okay, and I'm just going to leave it at that. What do you got to do? You're going to kill me? Okay, let's get on with it. Yeah, I'll take care of that later. <laughs> yeah. My wife and I frequently talk about when we're going to... We our, our girls love movies and love... I mean, everyone, I guess, loves movies. I don't know. They just really like stories. They have books and movies, and we love to tell stories. And frequently, our conversation... Because uh, I have regularly have parents go, 
would, would this be okay for my kids to watch? And I'm a terrible judge of that because, <laughs> because what I look for in a movie for my kids is different than other people. I'm not looking at content. In fact, I could tell you we watched a lot of scary movies with our kids over Halloween, and I heard other people saying like what they watched, and I was like, oh, I shouldn't tell them then what we watched with our kids. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you because I don't want you to get upset. But uh, I'm not looking at content. What I'm looking at is, what does this tell them about the way the world operates? And I'll tell you this, as much as I love superhero movies, I'm often very w weary now of how many superhero movies they watch because what superheroes tell them, and I see this in the way they operate, you have to be the strongest, Powerful. you have to be the yeah. best, you have to, and when there's a threat to the world, what's going to do it? Power and force will overcome it. And I then watch the way they play, and the way they play is if, and now I get this is all human nature, and you may think I'm going, but it's, it's, if I need it, I'm going to take it. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And if there's a problem that needs to be solved, it's going to come from me making it happen on my own. And Or I can show them Disney movies, and it all comes about just because you're beautiful. Just because you're wow. beautiful. <laughs> and so people have, heard yeah. me, people have heard me talk about this movie all the time, but you should watch Paddington. Paddington <laughs> is the movie we watch all the time because the movie, the central way is you are, he's, a, he, he's an immigrant to the country. He has nothing when he comes. And he, he's a bear. And he's a bear. <laughs> he's a bear, right? And just by sheer kindness and serving other people, every person in his community gets better. He gets better. People hate he's him at first. He's a lovable bear. And he's a lovable bear, and he wears no pants. So <laughs> anyway. and, and, and that reminds me of another movie that uh, was popular a generation ago that I think is the exact same kind of story, and that was Forrest Gump. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, that's right. That that's the same kind of premise. Right. It's this idea of there. There also a, didn't wear pants. No, he did. He yes, did yes, wear pants. Did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I just, I just yeah, wonder. I, just, <laughs> I think the way that we share. And so I, this isn't about movies. I love movies. And if you want to talk about movies, you can come talk with me about movies. But I do think the way we we form our imaginations, it does lead us to think. Well, if the truth is going to be defended or if something's going to happen, I have to force it to happen. The only way to make this happen, oh, and I do remember, we talked about this last week, was this book that I, I, I've, I've been hearing a lot of quotes out of, so I'm going to hopefully read this book soon. It's called The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. Oh, yeah. We You're talked talk about how about great that, of a yeah. title, title that, that is. is. But the point of the book was how in the early, you know, we, we look back at the earliest generations of the church and how quickly the movement spread from a historical standpoint. I mean, yes. it still was hundreds of years. Longer than our country has been alive, it took. Yes. yes. <laughs> but we just talk about in the grand scheme of history, it still is very fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in their lifetime, uh, the earliest Christians were just willing to die for what they believed. They were willing, they were willing to go into places and serve, not fight back, not force their way. Uh, most of them died under the, the hand of the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire still lasted another 200 years. But eventually, just through, and the way they talk about it is they didn't win the day by winning arguments and forcing their way. The way they won was, and this word was habitus, which was just their daily habits of loving and serving. And by the way they lived, even in their morality, the way they treated their wives and their children, People looked at it and said, okay, something's working over there. Maybe we should pay attention. And I think in our country, and I think in our lifetime, we're losing that. Yes. Because we feel like we have to defend something. Yeah, I had we a counselor more. tell me years ago, because, you know, argument is, again, a part of my form of control, talking, arguing. And he said, you know, Ed, when you win an argument, you don't, you don't win anything. That's right. Mm, that's great. And he said, well, the relationship what loses. did you ever win, and you actually got a prize at the end? Yeah. Well, I, the way I've always said it is, is you can win an argument, but the relationship, if anybody in a relationship wins, then the relationship loses. That's right. Yeah. So, all right, we've gone on long enough and could probably go on longer. I think we have. We, we hope will. this <laughs> Hopefully, it's a lot actually of makes it. If they're seeing it or hearing it, it worked. We Producer were actually, Joel we were has already six, destroyed the computer, we <laughs> so it's not even here anymore. All right. So uh, this week, Ed's got uh, an interesting uh Yeah, topic. we have three weeks in a row that are uh, one-offs, we would have called, but there are really three in a row that we planned out on specific things we wanted to talk about yep. that we think are very important to talk about over the next three weeks. So Each of the three of us they, will take Yeah, they are week. not... 
They are not necessarily tied together. They're tied together in the fact that they are very important things for us to talk about at this particular time. Yes. Yeah. So and this that's, Sunday in particular is really a, a it vision kind of Sunday, as we yeah. used to call these yeah, Sundays. Yeah, long time yeah. ago. What are we doing? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So, all right, one final question before we sign off. Um, as we've said earlier, it is election day today. I'm curious to know, do you guys think that by the time we record next week's podcast, we will actually know who won the election? I do. Yes. You think by, so? By, by next, I it'll be think Tuesday. So I'm probably, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I think by the time this actually drops, really, we will know. So, which will be Wednesday. I do. Yeah, we I, may not have the full results, I, I, but we will know it next. Again, I think that's... Okay. Mo- I'm probably going to be wrong. Right. I'm we'll probably see. going to be wrong. I'm willing to say that, but I think it's another part of the spin and all that. I mm-hmm. haven't felt the need to defend it, yep. but I think it's more of fear mongering. Maybe, right. maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Hey, if, if you never see this, it may be because we killed the internet. Yeah, <laughs> we could have not us. I mean, yeah, just- the global problem that's about to arise because of this United States election that affects 330 million people which is a small blip on the rest of the planet. Yeah. And with that, <laughs> we will see you next week.